Um, because in haste, I had two actually. Hi. So, will you be introducing or So, uh, thank you. Very good evening, delegates. Yes, go ahead. I welcome to the I welcome to the e-talk uh, on topic poorly controlled asthma in children's change in approach. And to present the topic, uh, we are having uh, Dr. Rajiv Bansal with us, uh, who is a senior consultant in HOD pediatrics. And uh, he has a, a fellowship in allergic and clinical immunology uh, from uh, Seventha Medical Co uh, College, Chennai. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Bansal is a fellow of Indian Academy of Pediatrics. So I welcome to Dr. Rajiv Bansal. And uh, now uh, session is yours, sir. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Om Prakarji. And thank you, the Lupin team. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak this evening on a very interesting topic of poorly controlled asthma in children. Now, what's the change in approach on this aspect? Asthma, as we, uh, just a second. The asthma, as we all, all know, is a disease with many variations, the phenotypes, usually characterized by chronic airway inflammation, and that has got two key defining features, a history of respiratory symptoms, such as wheeze, shortness of breath, chest tightness and cough, and a variable expiratory airflow limitation. Now you need to see in this definition and what has been mentioned here as the phenotypes. So that's one important thing. So asthma has got various phenotypes and the treatment is dependent on the various phenotypes that characterize asthma. The other thing is it's a chronic airway inflammation. And the third thing is we need to have a great emphasis on what history the, the patient presents with a history of respiratory symptoms like such as wheeze, shortness of breath, chest tightness and cough, which we need to be taking into consideration when we are evaluating a child has got an asthma or not and making a final diagnosis. The other thing is a variable expiratory airflow limitation, which we'll come to know when we evaluate these, child, these patients on the basis of tests which we undergo, these children undergo. So the qualifying features for the diagnosis of asthma include the episodic airflow obstruction, nocturnal symptoms, activity-induced symptoms, trigger-induced symptoms, activity limitation, and so on and so forth. But the important aspect is a very important one is a personal history and a family history of atopy and asthma in these patients. So if somebody has got a personal history of asthma and a family history for atopy and asthma, it, then it has got a re real good value. In 2020, to the GINA has uh, given some guidelines and those guidelines are very important when anybody or, or of us is evaluating a child and, and uh, giving the child a label of asthma. The, the most important thing is one need to test and diagnose before treating. Don't start managing a child of us with anti-asthmatic drugs before you make a final diagnosis. At the same time, you need to document the evidence for the diagnosis of asthma before starting the control and treatment. This is more so because it's very difficult to confirm the diagnosis afterwards because things might change. The information will change. The parameters on evaluating parameters will change. So one may not come to a final diagnosis of the child whom uh, he or she has started treatment has really got asthma or not. So, is it asthma or something different has to be addressed right at the beginning. There are conditions in preschool children which may mimic asthma, like the acquired causes of recurrent viral URI and the things might settle down, aspiration syndromes where a patient might have an aerodigestive disorder, there may be a foreign body with a monophonic wheeze, rhinosinusitis, tuberculosis and pertussis. And believe it or not, I've seen almost all of these patients in my life of 30 years spanning in my pediatric patient. Other causes could be congenital causes like cystic fibrosis, primary cellular disease, more and more being diagnosed and more understanding being there for this particular condition, immunodeficiency, congenital heart disease, tracheomalacia and bronchomalacia, which you, all of you see in day-to-day -day practice in some one, one or the other time, and congenital lobar emphysema. I have seen quite a lot of patients of congenital lobar emphysema in my life and vascular rings. And you have to believe I've seen vascular rings too. So they are all present and they may make asthma and the patient may be going from doctor to doctor for a certain period of time before it finally comes 
to a diagnosis to a place where a final diagnosis is made for these patients. So other thing is diagnosing asthma. Uh, in six to 18 years of age, uh, ch children. The, the, uh, those feet like uh, sneezing, itching, blocked nose, throat clearing, maybe diagnosed as asthma in certain patients, though, though they may be suffering from uh, allergic rhinitis or some other conditions. Or oh, with a sudden onset of symptoms, if a patient may be having an uh, inhaled foreign body or a recurrent infection of productive cough. Uh, which might lead to uh, a suggestion that the patient has got, in fact, a bronchiectasis rather than asthma. Recurrent infections with productive cough and sinusitis may be a hallmark of primary ciliary dyskinesia in these patients, cardiac murmurs, which suggest a kind of heart disease, a preterm delivery symptoms that since birth may suggest that a patient is, in fact, suffering from bronchopulmonary dysplasia and patient may have cystic fibrosis. And as you all know, India, Indian patients do have cystic fibrosis. And it, it has been now really very well documented by many of the clinic, uh, by experts like Dr. Cabra and other people. So when we are thinking in terms of asthma control, we need to address also the comorbidities associated with this condition in the form of allergic rhinitis, eczema, food allergy, and obesity. And obesity is one of a very important factor where asthma control may be hampered with if it's comorbid along with it. So we need to address all these conditions before we really come to the real point of as proper asthma control. The various investigations need to be undertaken uh, to prove that, so when we are coming now to the definition and trying and understand the definition, it has been seen we need to come to a diagnosis with the help of certain investigations also. And these investigations are important. Uh, like in smaller children, uh, in, at for home management, you can have a peak expiratory for a, a meat, uh, meter, which can be utilized uh, for small, uh, slightly grown up children, especially children beyond six years of age, you can use a spirometer. And uh, you can use an FENO test in your OPD practice. In fact, I have used FENO test as one of an ancillary test to find out it's an eosinophilic asthma or not. And then very small children, you can find out, uh, especially in the specialized centers with the help of impulse oximetry that a small child less than five years of age has got bronchial asthma or not. So the various investigations like FENO, which suggest the TH2 inflammation in response to inhaled steroids, a skin prick twist, a patient may be having atopy and allergy and the, the skin test might then tell you that yes, this patient has got an allergy customer. The sputum can be utilized for cell component analysis or a bronchial alveolar lavage can, and a biopsy can be used for a tissue component analysis. Exhaled breath temperature can be used for to analyze the airway temp inflammation. Exhaled breath condensate can be used for a patient phenotyping and volatile organic compounds can be used for various types of asthma phenotypic diagnosis. At the same time, a very important tool for evaluation and, uh, in an uh, OPD practice is, is asking the patient to maintain an asthma diary. With this helps tremendously in evaluation of the treatment, the compliance and outcome of these patients. One can note down the symptoms, the peak flow readings and the medicine that which are, the patient is utilizing in a very simplified manner. This can be utilized on a day-to-day -day basis. A patient can bring in this uh, asthma diary to the, to, uh, to the clinician and the clinician wants to see it at the variability of the peak flows, the symptoms which the patient is suffering from, the day or the night symptoms or uh, hampering the day-to-day -day activity of the child and what medications the child is having. And at the same time, analyzing the number of canisters a, a patient is utilizing, which may give you an insight into the control of asthma. Present day is a very different time. It's a, it's a modern time of personalized medication. One need to customize asthma treatment and taking which need to be taken into account, the level of symptom control, this risk factors or exacerbations, the phenotypic characteristics, not everything fits for everybody. The preferences of the patients, the effectiveness of available medication, the safety of medication, which is of paramount important in today's world and the cost to the patient the pair. India is a country of poor people and not necessarily what you are prescribing will be taken back by the patient and be utilizing in his day-to-day -day treatment protocol. 
they may finish up their uh, uh, canisters, may not come back to you, may not have adequate amount of money. There are very few who have a pair for their uh, treatment. And in that case, uh, the things are very different. And then those payers may ask you why, why things are behaving like that manner. So we have to have the pragmatic into our approach of uh, having a correct diagnosis and then giving a correct personalized medication to these patients. So what are the aims of asthma control? The main aim of asthma control, when we really, uh, like I myself is an asthmatic, and I've always, I, I know that I will never probably outgrow of this, but I, I should have a good control of asthma so that it doesn't hamper my activity. So what is important? I need not to have a minimal or ideally no chronic symptoms, including nocturnal symptoms. I must be sleeping well. At the same time, there should be no limitation of my activity. There should be no emergency visits. I should have a near normal or normal PFR should have infrequent or minimal exacerbations, minimum need for as needed beta agonist. And almost for sure, it, if you need more than one canister in a month, that is 12 canisters in a year, that means you are probably not well controlled. A peak expiratory flow variability of less than 20%, a minimal or no persistent for limitation, and minimal or no adverse effects of medication. So I would be very happy if I have all these things being taken care of in my day-to-day -day, uh, treatment. So when, when we are thinking, talking in terms of asthma control, we need to avoid trouble cell symptoms during day and night. We need to have little or no relief of medication as I've emphasized earlier, have productive, physically active life, have normal or near normal tongue function. So I'm getting older and I wish I'd survive for a longer period of time with a normal lung. And this can only happen if I have a good asthma control and avoid serious asthma flare up so that I don't let up into the hospital. So what are the key changes which Gina has uh, outlined in its 2020 guidelines? It's two important things, symptom control and evaluation of the risk factor. Lung function is no more included among symptom control measures and asthma severity is a retrospective label assessed from the treatment needed to control asthma that need to be understood very clearly. So what are the risk factors for poor asthma control? Let's try and thread barely figure it out what they are. They include, they, they could be disease related, they could be patient related, or they could be a pediatrician or a physician related. So we can have, a patient may be having comorbidities which will be responsible for the poor control or having exposure to various triggers, or patient may be having poor adherence to medication. At the same time, the pediatrician Pediatrician physician has no has not educated his patient correctly on the use of inhaled medication, and there is a poor doctor-patient communication. Now that's of paramount importance. If you don't have for any of the illnesses, in fact, what to talk about asthma, a poor doctor-patient communication and no patient education, you are likely to falter into your treatment and your controls of any disease as per se will be very bad. We need to also know about the risk factors for poor asthma outcomes, the risk, uh, the risk factor for developing fixed airway limitations like preterm birth, exposure to tobacco smoke, low FEV1, uh, eosinophils of the blood and the sputum, other risk factors for medication like systemic and local side effects of the drug which need to be clearly elucidated. So what we have to look at in case of frequent exacerbations of poor control, is ask for specific factors for, um, from all these patients. Check for drugs, drug, what the drug patient is taking, what's the dose and the device they are utilizing. These three Ds are very, very important. Always look for the technique, look for the more comorbid condition and treat them. Reassess the history and clinical examination at each visit we have and we have to learn as clinicians to reassess the history and clinical examination need to do. I distinctly remember today itself in the, in, in the morning when I was seeing a patient, a very different thing, not from asthma, what I had thought for the last visit and when, when I took the history and when did the clinical examination, things were totally different. And I was wondering, where, why did I falter? Why didn't I take this history earlier? Why did I didn't poke the patient properly or the relatives properly to give me a clue to the diagnosis and I had to revise my diagnosis 
because the patient was not improving. So in asthma also, you need to revise your diagnosis if a patient is not controlled properly, and you need to think, need to poke into the all details of the history and then do a clinical examination. At the same time, we need to find out the common triggers responsible for poor control, like tobacco smoke, smoke from the firewood in kitchen, incense sticks, the diesel, the diesel, the diesel, the, if a patient is uh, staying near a highway, the diesel is a very important culprit in increasing uh, in, in, in increasing poor asthma control, the perfume, the body sprays, the house dust mites, a very important factor, especially in, in climatic conditions where it's wet and, and very cold, pets at home, pollen, certain food items and additives, physical exertion, emotion plays a great role in the weather changes. So we need to uh, ask the patient about various symptoms, especially the day symptoms, as I told you earlier, the night symptoms, the relief of use, and what the level of activity. Various questions can be asked. One can ask, how does the child have a cough or wheeze or dyspnea or breathing problem? What triggers the problems in the daytime? And is the child able to sleep properly? Is he tired during the day and is not able to sleep properly? How often is a relief of medication used by this patient? We need to distinguish, especially with the fact that we need to know that sometime uh, before exercise or sport, these patients are in the habit of taking inhalation, which should not be taken as a, a sign of poor control and the level of activity the child is able to manage. So these are important asthma symptoms which should be under control and has to be taken care of and asked for. We need to also distinguish two important, the other important thing. We need to distinguish between what is poor control and what is difficult to treat asthma. There are two different things. That's one is refractory asthma. And we have major and minor criteria to label a child or a patient to be suffering from refractory asthma. A major criteria of which are the continuous or near continuous oral steroids and high doses of inhaled corticosteroids, which is not the case in poorly controlled asthma. The factors are different, as I'll tell you later. At the same time, we need to potentially identify potentially modifiable risk factors for flare-ups or exacerbation in these patients, like the medications, high use of SABA, comorbidities, exposures like to smoke and allergens, the context, and what's the psychosocial issues associated and the lung function of these patients. So to summarize, one, what one has to see on a follow-up visit of these patients, one need to assess their symptoms very in detail, in detail. Yeah, that's very important. A certain the level of control, which, have, which I'll show you how we can assess. Check on drug compliance. This is to be done every time and reinforce the do's and don'ts which need to be taken care of. So what we need to emphasize, we need to have a checklist with us. And what is that checklist is in the past four weeks as a patient had a daytime asthma symptom more than twice, uh, per week, any night waking during asthma, SABA reliever, or any activity limitation due to asthma. We need to see, is it, are the box checked out or checked in as yes or no? And then we'll know that it's a well-controlled asthma, a partly controlled asthma, and uncontrolled asthma. That's what Zena has given for children between six and 18 years of age. At the same time, we need to assess the risk factors for poor asthma outcomes, assess the risk factors are diagnosed and periodically thereafter and measure the FE win at the start of the treatment after three to six months of control of treatment to record the patient's personal best lung function and then periodically for ongoing risk assessment and spirometer uh, spirometry comes at a very handy tool and if you if you teach these patients properly these small children from six to 18 years of age do a of good spirometry and they can you can have a real good assessment as to what is and you can assess and make it out, is my patient well-controlled or not? A well-controlled patient gives you real satisfaction because a patient then comes and tells you, yes, doctor, I'm very well. I'm much better than what I was. And what's more heartening to a doctor? More heartening to a doctor is a good control. A good control makes a major difference and also gives you a, a real good insight in managing, managing your next patients also. So that has to be taken care of at the same time. So we have uh, various tools to find out 
is the asthma symptom control tools are there. There, there are various tools for to six to 11 years of age. They are based on symptoms, limitation of activities and use of rescue medication. There are numeric, asth numeric asthma control scores for children, like the ch asth childhood asthma control test or asthma control questionnaire. Various things can be asked from the patient in the OPD. Very short time is needed. Very, not many, many minutes are spent onto that, but you can have a quick look into it and check, check it out. Uh, asthma control scores, which include exacerbation with symptoms and tests for respiratory and asthma control in kits. That's the track and the composite asthma severity index. They are from various bodies and they can be utilized, uh, which are av available online also. For adolescents, you can use simple screening tools, as for example, consensus-based GINA symptom control tool, categorical symptom control tools, as, as for example, three questions tool, the RCP tool, the numerical asthma control tools, as for example, asthma control questionnaire and asthma control test, they can be utilized for adolescents. So Gina has clearly said that the most common cause of uncontrolled asthma in the present era is the un incorrect inhaler technique. You have to believe that 80% of the time, if your patient is poorly controlled, it's because of incorrect inhalational technique. So you have to spend time, not only in your diagnosis, in your history and investigation, but at each visit, you have to see to it that there is a correct inhaler technique being utilized by the patient. So what I do in my practice, I ask the patient to bring back, to bring their inhalers back to me and with their spacers and see how good they are into what I've already taught or make them understand. At the same time, we have to analyze and assess the adherence of inhalational therapy. And that has been seen and evaluated. Now, if Gina is talking pan world, all over the world, and you have to believe how much it's more, much more in, in our Indian setting with, where the understanding sometimes is not up to a mark. And G, according to Gina, the poor adherence is up to 50% of the population. So 50% of the patients who have asthma, who have been prescribed inhalation medication, in fact, don't adhere to their medication and they can turn into a category of poor outcome or poor, or poor control. So every time when a patient comes, you have to see the inhaler technique, ask them to bring back the inhalers, see how they utilize it, and are they adherent to it, the history can tell you. Let me share you a case which I just saw about two or three days back. Uh, is an eight year old boy, Himanshu was on inhalational therapy for the last nine months and recently came to me for the, in the OPD for the follow up. The mother complained that though the child was well controlled in initial few months, is not, is not well now. And inquiring to show how he was taken in us, now see the results. Now this is what his spacer was. All this was a transparent spacer from another, uh, and now this is all white. And it, this the mother has not cleaned it for a long period of time. And if you see it carefully, the inhaler has a marking of zero. It's an empty canister. So this was the fallacies of inhalational te techniques in this patient. He did not knew how and when to actuate the device. In fact, when I asked him again. He didn't knew the cleaning, he has to clean the device or the mother didn't knew the, the device need to be clean. Checking the inhaler content, it was empty. In fact, I had told him, the mother and the, unfortunately the attendance also changed. I distinctly remember of telling everyone, my, my, my attending nurse or my nursing aide is trained by me to, to tell everyone how to check that the inhaler, the inhaler or the canister which is being given to them, uh, how to assess it's empty, how much uh, 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 drug is left inside. But unfortunately, the mother wasn't aware of that. Incorrect technique of inhalation holding and only sometime, and oh, in fact, majority, because this was zero, which the child was in fact using the reliever only and not using the, the controller. And that was responsible for the poor control of asthma in this particular child. So for effective use of inhaler devices, up to 80% patients cannot use the inhalers correctly. And one need to remember four C's to, in their OPDs, one need to choose the most appropriate device and prescribe a spacer to all patients. See in this picture, 
you can see the mother is trying to give an inhaler directly in the mouth of the child. How, how can this child be relieved? Check the physical, check. So you need to choose the right device. You need to check the physical demonstration, paying attention to incorrect step. Check technique and maybe check it two or three times. In fact, every time a patient is prescribed an uh, inhaler uh, and a spacer by, by me, either me, myself, or my nursing aide, it demonstrates physically in front, ask the mother to give it, see to it that the child is able to handle the equipment. In small child, you need to give them to play the, the, the spacer so that they are not scary of the spacer. And as the child grows up, they should realize what it is, how to put it into the mouth, how correctly to put it, put it, put it properly into the mouth, how, how, uh, how properly the, uh, it should be, it put, uh, the mouth it should fit into the mouth, how, how to breathe, how to properly exhale, how, to, how much to hold, how, how long to hold, when to actuate, everything need to be absolutely demonstrated in a proper manner. So we need to choose the right thing, we need to check, we need to correct using a physical demonstration. So once they come back, we should pay to do the incorrect steps and check two or three times. Once at the worst, first time when we are prescribing at that time, and then once the patient comes for a follow-up, the first time, the second time, and maybe the multiple times when they come, because you first or second time, they may be doing the right thing. But over a period of time, mother will say, or somebody will come and tell the child, that why are you using the spacer? Oh, you are grown up now. You don't need a spacer anymore. And the child starts taking directly. I've seen umpteen number of times the patient taking the inhaler directly without a spacer and not getting a proper control. So we need to have a proper control and confirm. You have checklists for each of the inhalers you prescribe and to demonstrate the correct technique. So the four C's are choose, check, correct, and confirm. And this is need to be emphasized every time when a patient comes to your OPD for a treatment. So again, emphasizing, investing in a child with poor, poor symptom control is watch the patient using the inhaler, discuss adrenaline and barriers to use. There may be certain barriers in the mind of people that this might harm my child, this I cannot do, I don't like it, or, the, or, or what others will think. My, my, uh, is my child estimating, uh, it might be a taboo to them, but all those smaller things which are there in their mind or bigger things which come to their mind need to be addressed at this point of time. We also need to confirm the diagnosis, well, that's very, very important. If possible, remove potential risk factors, assess and manage the comorbidities as we discussed earlier, and then only we consider the step up of treatment. So what is also important is patient and parent education on asthma, we need to address all the questions that come to mind of the patient and the parents. What is asthma? What causes asthma? Why my child has got asthma? That's a very important question. Is asthma the same as allergy? We need to tell them what's the distinction between these two. Will it be lifelong? That's what everybody wants to know for any disease, in, as a matter of fact. Will the medicine harm and continue lifelong? That's a very important thing to be addressed to. And you need to tell how, what is to control, when they can decrease their medication and when they may have to step up their medication and the role of alternative medications, medicines or treatment or therapies. What the goals of communication are, then make them accept the diagnosis. We need to understand the trigger factor. They need to understand. The concept of controller and reliever need to be emphasized into each and every parent. The proper use of drug relief system uh, has the most important value. The likely prognosis in individual cases might differ. This needs to be told. One, if somebody tells my other friend got okay, doesn't mean that you will also go, go okay. But yes, if you take your medications properly, if you if you if you are compliant with the treatment which has been prescribed, certainly you can be a part of it. You can be very well controlled. You may not get out of it, but certainly you will be very good control. Lifestyle modification and rate reduction is a very important component of asthma management and one need to be psychologically fit to have a proper asthma control. So there are certain essential skills and guided asthma management. In the present time, we need a very self-discipline and a proper guided 
way, way, way of uh, treatment for these patients. So we have to have asthma information booklets. We need to have uh, to, to master them in, in relational skills. We need to master them and making them understand the adherence. We should have a written asthma action plan for these patients. We need to tell them how to, they can self-monitor their symptoms and come to our doctor and make the, make the doctor understand that what's wrong, going wrong. And at the same time, we have to have a regular medical review of these patients. We should not say, come after six months, the patient might be suffering in between, and then you don't know what, what has gone wrong. And it's, it's flaring, it's inside. It's, it's like a smoldering fire inside the body. So what are the factors to be considered before stepping up the asthma treatment? We need to address incorrect diagnosis. Well, I, I, if you ask me after 35 years of practice, how often I need stepping up my asthma treatment. You have to believe that Indians don't go probably needing or uh, having a need for step two, uh, step three or four. They invariably stop at step two. So why? Because you, as a clinician, we might not be uh, uh, giving a full regard to, to the proper asthma, uh, to, to the proper technique and adherence. So if you do that, probably many of the Indians don't need a high dose of uh, medication for control of medication. So we have to address the incorrect diagnosis, incorrect inhaler technique, incorrect choice of the device. Your choice of the device, the age should be appropriate. We need to address the poor adherence if at all is there, modifiable risk factors, especially smoking inside the home. If they are very near a highway, the diesel, the diesel output and the symptoms due to comorbid condition like allergic rhinitis. If a patient has got allergic rhinitis and that is not addressed, the patient might not be under control. So we have to give well therapy because it's a united airway and both things need to be addressed at the same time. So if you want to utilize the, this beautifully uh, written treatise from the China, where uh, they have clearly uh, told us how to manage uh, patients of asthma in six to 11 years of age and adolescent and adults, where we have to review the response, we have to assess and we have to adjust the treatment of these patients. And then maybe go from step one, step two, step three, step four and step five. Certainly what I have already told you will come a long way. If you have, a, if you right from the beginning, you make, to un make them understand the correct technique and the correct way of adherence, we need to assess, adjust and review on a regular basis. Every we will not need many more steps to go up, except in a very few patients, a very few patients. You don't need 400, micro, 400 micrograms of a drug of, of, um, uh, for ICS. You might just have to use 100 or max of 200 of, of these drugs in your patients, telling them how to rinse them out, telling them how to adhere to things and how to take it properly. So uh, I wish we have children who take the drug properly and they run around with, with no symptoms at all, have a nice sleep. And where I work in this hospital, this beautiful hospital of mine, is known as Santokh Hospital. I wish I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, the parents tell me, yes, doctor, my child is absolutely under control and I'm so happy to get the inhalation medication for my patient. Thank you, Medimad, for your patient hearing. Yeah, Pradeep ji. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Thank you. We sir. are so honored to be here tonight and grateful to you uh, for the uh, such a meaningful insight into the topic. And thank you all delegates on behalf of Lupin Respira Aspiritus uh, to attend the e-talk. Uh, thank you so much. And, and so we have any questions? Yes, sir, we have questions. Yeah. Uh, I'll just uh, take one by one and you can address them, sir. Uh, so uh, we have one query from uh, uh, Dr. Himangini, who is from Pune. She wants to know, so how would you go about management of a viral disease and asthmatic disease? Diagnosis and management of viral and asthmatic Diagnosis. So you have to take a detailed history. What's the age group of the child? That's very important. Invariably, viral associated wheezing is more common in children less than five years of age. 
So if a child has got a short duration history and uh, especially with a running nose and a fever and if there is no other past history of uh, uh, illness or wheezing and uh, it, sometimes you'll come to know only in retrospect that it was while induced wheezing. So children, especially children, if it's, especially if, if the episodes are less than three or per year, so it might be probably that the child is not suffering from asthma, but a viral is wheezing. And at that point of time, simple medications can be, you don't need to have a long-term controller medication for these patients and they, they can be taken care of. Thank you, sir. So there is one query from Dr. Subhash, who is from uh, Kolkata, you want to know in non-COVID patients, would you prefer nebulization therapy? So I'm not a, I, I'm absolutely no fan of nebulization in my practice. If you ask me after 35 years of my practice, I don't have a nebulizer in my clinic. I use a spacer, a mask and a, a, a inhaler for treating all my patients of asthma, uh, or acute wheezing, or uh, and those these patients can be given in uh, puffs, uh, uh, and uh, this this is much more effective. The size of the particle which you deliver with the help of an inhaler is much smaller and reach to to the deeper areas. vis vis as compared to when you use a nebulizer, and and when you use a nebulizer, there are so multiple kinds of nebulizers which are which may not deliver the right kind of medication, the right point of place of time. They're more fancy stuff, and there's more. It, they unfortunately, are more popular. But uh, all those cooperative patients, or you have learned the technique of giving it, probably never ever need to have nebulizer in your clinic. And I, you have to believe in me. I don't have a nebulizer, and I can treat any and every kind of patient with us in inhaler. So there's one query uh, from. Uh... Dr. Uh, Sushil, who is from Delhi, he wants to know for how long do you recommend inhaled corticosteroids management of severe asthma? Whether you step, uh, uh, whether you uh, go for a combination or you begin with the oral, uh, begin with the inhaled ICs. Well, the present recommendation from Gina is giving a combined formiterol and ICS inhaler even in step one or step one as on uh, initially and then as you go up step uh, a combination is used so you can use it for your regular controller medication as well as reliever so as such now a combination of this uh, th those formatrol and ics is being recommended as a standard use varying on the dosages depending on the severity of illness in these patients thank you sir so there is one query from uh, dr uh, Mezreen, uh, who is from Hyderabad, she wants to know: uh, Do you? What is your opinion, or do you prefer omalizumab in management of severe asthma, and for how long? That, that's a. I don't have a personal experience using omalizumab, and uh, that, that's a very small subset of patients of asthma which needs omalizumab. So that, that that's a very different topic, and it needs a detailed evaluation. Uh, of, of these patients before one consider omelizumab and unfortunately uh, CIPLA was uh, uh, marketing this and it's not, you know, that easily available. So uh, I think, I don't think that this is the right forum to discuss on this issue. Uh, so there's one query, a doctor says in many webinars, newer tools and diagnosis of asthma that is fractionally exhaled nitric oxide is discussed. So you, since you have also discussed what is your a view on it and how would it help in the management of asthma since the test seems to be very expensive. You, uh, FENO has been, I've got a uh, recent exposure of using it's a, a, to a handheld FENO device for diagnosis of asthma and uh, it, it corroborates your diagnosis and uh, um, uh, though the equipment is expensive but it's very easy to use. One time cost, if I remember it correctly, for a patient is around 400, 500 rupees for the, um, uh, for the disposable, which, which is utilized for this. And uh, especially to distinguish the asthma phenotype, one can use FENO device to know is it eosinophilic asthma or anisophilic asthma. So it's, it can be useful, yes, certainly. Thank you, sir. Uh, so in which group, age group of patients do you recommend spirometry? 
a question from uh, any child beyond six years of age, uh, if if properly counselled with, can uh, can do a spirometry. So anything beyond six years of age, or maybe sometimes five years of age, spirometry can be done. Uh, so while managing asthma, do you manage asthma by uh, stepping down the therapy or by reducing number of stuff or puffs? My my personal take is I do a step up rather than step down. So I, uh, and I'm a firm believer that majority of the Indian children don't need very high dosages of inhaled corticosteroids. So if if it's properly explained to patients, ninety to ninety five percent of my patients, or maybe even more than those patients, if properly explained uh, the inhalational techniques as well as adherence to the medication do extremely well, are very well controlled on low dose ICS. So how would you, uh, uh, can we use an ICS therapy in management of an atopic asthma? Why not? But it all, you have to find out why, what's the atopy behind. Yes, why not? Uh, so there is a query uh, in management of allergic rhinitis with concomitant asthma, uh, what should be our treatment regimen? You have to use inhale, inhale the corticosteroid, uh, intranasal corticosteroids, along with inhale the uh, ICS through a spacer for these patients. Hello. There is one more. Uh, since you have already answered on nebulization, sir, uh, how would you go about management of an uncontrolled asthma? in spite of being on inhalation therapy and uh, for a six months, even the parents have a history of asthma. No, I think we need to go back to what I have spoken. We have to check, check, correct, and then only, well, parents, uh, parents have got asthma, it's okay. So that makes your diagnosis confirm that probably after doing substantial other tests that your patient is suffering from asthma. But what medication uh, the child will need what will be the dosages, whether the child will be controlled or not, will all depend upon how good you have educated the child and how much adherent the child or the parents are to the medications which you have prescribed. So if you, if you, if the, the treatment will remain the same if the parents have or not have, but it will add to your diagnostic diagnosis. And your correct diagnosis might be, yes, the parents do have it. Now, if a parent also have it, then probably they already know how to use, or maybe they may be incorrectly in both ways, you know. A parent may be using it directly, and they think that for a child also, they can use it directly. For both of them, in fact, it's wrong. It's a wrong method. So they have to realize that they have to use spacer, they need proper adherence to medication, and the treatment will then remain what we have already discussed with. Can we use a peak flow meter since there's a lot of controversies on using as a monitoring tool in management of asthma? That's, uh, that's a very cheap uh, uh, device to utilize. I've been using peak flow meters since the time I've been trained almost 30, 35 years back. I had the uh, Wittlograph uh, peak flow meter with me and then various other local Indian brand, uh, things which were available. It's, it's an easy tool. So if, if, you, if you note it down, there are various uh, 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 age-related uh, uh, peak flow meter uh, uh, readings which are available for age, the height, the altitude, and so on and so forth, and which you can use it for, for your day-to-day -day monitoring. And, for, and you can, uh, one can do morning and evening peak flow metry, and uh, one can know when the exacerbations are likely to happen. So all these things are for, I mean, doing a spirometry is going to a doctor's office, but doing, uh, having a peak flow meter at home, using it for, to, uh, with, a, with the help of asthma diary, you can utilize it and you can do it. I mean, before you take your medications, you can do a peak flow meter, put it, jot it down, and uh, depending upon the height, weight, and the altitude where you live, a doctor already has uh, a fair enough of idea what's your uh, and and then you ought, ought to know what your best days are and what's your best peak flow meter, flow, flow metry. And when it declines, I mean, say it's less than 20%, it declines by about 20%, then you know you're into real trouble or you're not taking your medications properly. 
uh, so there is one query uh, by doctor says that since um, in children many a times the ndi use can we use a dpi device or dpi dye powder inhalers uh, in children in management of asthma any day dpis are inferior to mdis but yes india is a country with poor people and uh, the dpis are much more cheaper as compared to mdis so all those children who can who understand and who are cooperative enough to do, to take a dpi device so uh, then uh, you have to choose the right dpi because you have to see to it that they understand the right D, the dpi how to use it properly and they and the right inhalational techniques yes i have got lots of patients who want to do dpi so all those poor patients of mine who who have difficulty in understanding and uh, who are, or maybe i i start with dpi in those patients who are slightly skeptical of using an inhaler because the other important thing is they are very handy especially in keeping at school or workplaces or uh, so they, they they just come into and fit into their pocket because then they don't have to take a spacer uh, into their offices or into the school the school bag and thirdly uh, you know uh, people are shy not to let the other other person know they are very reserved about it that uh, they want asthma so they will probably not like to disclose it to their friends and families in those situations for well, any child who uh, have used dpis in children who are beyond 5 years of age very easily sometime even 4 years of age but yes certainly beyond 5 or 6 years of age you can use dpi but definitely they are inferior to mdis so since uh, there is a query from doctor since you have a wide experience in pediatric pulmonology and being a, a pediatrician at pune why most of the patients or parents are more comfortable uh, using uh, uh, oral medication or the syrups in management of asthma how would would you convince them to start the inhalation therapy no that's where the trick lies you have to tell no uh, i'll tell you what i share and i tell my parents let's suppose you are an asthmatic i'll say i'll tell them where is your problem is sab meri saans mein dikkat hai so in saans mein kahan dikkat hai ka mere fephde mein dikkat hai fephde mein kahan dikkat hai so i'll show him a figure say so fephde mein kaun si jagah pe aapko dikkat hai saans mein yahan pe dikkat hai so you have to get the medicine where into your lungs at which place at the most peripheral level so how will you use it how will you get the medication over there there are two ways either aap muh se dawai lijiye muh se jaane ke baad dawa kahan jayegi pet mein jayegi pet ke jaane ke baad gulegi gul ke khoon mein jayegi khoon se liver mein jayegi liver mein processing hogi processing ho ke wapas khoon mein aayegi khoon se wapas lungs mein jayegi aur lungs se wahan jayegi jahan pe effect ho raha this is the travel and now you imagine har jagah dawai ko apni dalali deni padegi wahan tak pahunchne ke liye on the other hand if you use a proper inhalational technique the moment you inhale the drug reaches directly to the site where it's supposed to be deposited now you analyze jo cheez ek sambhav chennai se jaipur ke liye koi cheez bhejne ho to raste mein kai jagah utregi kai jagah dalali deni padegi saman aadha beech mein chori ho jayega at the on the other side if it coming by road or by train but at the, on the other hand if it comes by flight it directly reaches jaipur without a pilferage so that you can explain and you can also tell if the amount of drug which is to be given to the child this is the say it's almost 50 to 100 times more as compared to when you give it by the inhalational route so are you prepared anything if it given in large amount certainly will have more side effects so if you are giving a drug with more side effects are you prepared for that if you want that i can give you that way but at the same but but the problem of your child lies only into the lung when you are giving a oral medication the the drug not only goes to your lung but through the blood is spread to all over your body including your brain to your kidneys your liver and so and so forth they don't have any right to be eating that medication so why you want to give that medication when your lung only need that medication or your respiratory airways need that medication that's how you can explain thank you sir for well elucidating that so so there's a query from uh, dr gupta who says that uh, in management of a severe allergic rhinitis patient do you prefer doing a skin prick test and for how many allergens do you prefer it 
14 or 48? I think what's more important is a very detailed history. History, history, history is the most important thing to find it out the cause or the likely susceptible agent for the, which is leading to allergic rhinitis or asthma. In children, you don't even need 20 allergens to be tested. It all depends upon what, if, how properly you have taken the history. So the, so the answer is not even 20, just around 20, that's more than enough. Thank you, sir. So um, now in the management of an exercise induced asthma, uh, do, uh, do we need to prescribe the medication before the child would start his activity or we need to continue the medication for three to six months depending upon the symptoms? Exercise induced asthma is just uh, is telling you that real th things are bad inside. So you need to have a control of medication along with. If a child needs uh, the need to be uh, if every time the child exercises, the child gets into a problem. So in that in that case, you don't need a simple reliever. You need a controller so that the child uh, doesn't need uh, doesn't have a hampering of the exercise. Because sometimes what happens is, as the child realizes that this amount of exercise gives me more problem, they the, they start limiting their exercise, and a time comes when they will think that this small of I don't have asthma because I don't need I, I don't need a medication. But what has happened is they in fact have restricted themselves to such an extent that they don't get into a problem. So the, the fire is inside, but they are not able to identify because they, they are not doing the, the amount of exercise they would have otherwise done with. So certainly because the, a time will come when they, they will just know that what doesn't give me a trouble. So I would advise a proper treatment rather than an improper treatment in these patients. Thank you, sir. So there's a query from a doctor. He says that in the uh, in a, one of his uh, past, he has learned about the allergic march uh, in a patient uh, in one of the webinars. And he says in uh, due to this allergic march, is there a symptom more prolification of an asthma into it? Pardon? Is there a more prolification of asthma? Yeah, asthma asthma uh, is like you have atopic dermatitis and then it's it depends upon what kind of uh, asthma you have, what phenotype of asthma you have. So if you've got an allergic asthma, it may start with allergic dermatitis and then you may have allergic rhinitis and then you have a, an asthma uh, as you go older. So it's part of the allergic mark. So yes, certainly if things are addressed earlier, they are taken care of earlier, you, one has identified what is, what is responsible for allergy in these patients. And if you take care of it, like especially in cases of house dust mite, uh, the world, if you, if you come to know that the patient has got uh, house dust mite allergy, you address the house dust mite allergy, the patient might not end up into too much of a trouble and things might stop at, cer at certain point. So this could be one way of doing things. Uh, so this is one a question from a doctor. He says that uh, he has a patient who is with a severe asthmatic and uh, in spite of a long-term duration of a therapy, his asthma is not controlled. So do you think that there is a time when he needs to be referred for doing a bronchoscopy? It all depends upon the history, a re-evaluation. Yes, certainly if he has got severe asthma, one has to re the, e evaluate not only bronchoscopy, many other things will be needed. Why only bronchoscopy? Bronchoscopy will only tell you what is inside into bronchoscopy. There may be other reasons for it that we had already discussed. So we need to find it out. It, it needs definitely a expert opinion who will holistically look into this patient rather than doing only a bronchoscopy. So if you keep the patient with you and then send him from bronchoscopy to an ENT surgeon and he comes back and tells you that the, the ENT surgeon tells you that there's nothing inside, it will not complete the list of things. So then he needs to a proper specialist who needs, knows all causes of asthma and with history and proper examination and then using various tools will identify what's the probable cause of that severe asthma or uncontrolled asthma in that particular patient. There's one more query which says that a child is uh, complaining of 
super severe acidity and also has an asthma problem so should uh, we first treat the acidity and and see whether the asthma flare ups or we should treat both acidity uh, the gi and asthma together acidity per se is loose to not use loosely use the word acidity in majority of patients so in fact if they are properly initial proper medication a proper diagnosis done and the proper medication given then probably acidity can be make make that okay the other thing is certain dietary changes instead of giving drug the timing and the lifestyle modification need to be undertaken these patients so they have to proper sleep uh, eat food at the right time uh, at least two or three hours gap before they go to bed uh, not too much of a fatty food a food which gives them trouble and uh, 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 if if a patient is very obese then we be taking care of their weight doing some uh, regular exercises yoga all those things will make the, do a long way so a lifestyle modification i would prefer rather than giving an anti acidity medication yes a small subset of patient will certainly need uh, anti acidity medication but they need to be evaluated before they are giving that there is one a query it says that a patient has got an atopic dermatitis he has been treated for 6 months and now the child is complaining of uh, uh, seems to be like an asthma symptoms complaining mm-hmm. of wheeze so do you think that the atopic dermatitis has progressed into asthma yeah it's a possibility there is an atopic there, there, there is a march which may occur so we need to evaluate why is the what is the cause for atopic dermatitis Uh, is is there any trigger factors which are responsible can we identify triggers in this this patient has he got an allergic uh, uh, has he got a house dust mite allergy and so on and so forth certainly we need to evaluate the child properly and then come to a conclusion what are the possible factors which are responsible for uh, for exacerbations and then address them and this patient for asthma the same doctor has a query uh, like or uh, should he have started with the asthma treatment right from the start along with a treatment of the dermatitis well it depends upon is your patient has your patient manifested with asthma when he had atopic dermatitis so if if uh, uh, not necessarily a patient may be manifesting with asthma when he initially presented to you with atopic dermatitis so why should you give him a treatment for asthma if the manifestation or not, not there i think we need to go to our definition which we, which i have discussed right at the first step uh, to find just find it out are there symptoms which are suggestive of asthma if the symptoms are suggestive of asthma we need to document is it really asthma with whatever tools which we have at, at us at our disposal if with those two things we come to a conclusion that the patient is suffering from asthma certainly yes the patient need to be treated for asthma thank you sir So this were the queries which uh, we have uh, received from the audience, and rest are all on the nebulization. I mean, so which you have already uh, shared. Nebulization will be should be a very separate topic, and I'm not a fan of nebulization. <laughs> yes, sir. so so those are the questions pertaining to that. Uh, thank you, sir. For nebulization per se is more of a hospital-based business. For an outpatient clinic, nebulization should not be encouraged at all. This is as per my mind. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for sharing your thoughts and taking your valuable time from your practice today with us. Uh, for the entire delegates who are live with us, Pan India, and answering to all the queries, and the queries are something new which have popped up this time. Uh, some of doctors have also appreciated the talk, talking about the pheno and also talking about the impulse oscillometry in the session. So thank you, sir, uh, for your valuable time. I hand over to Pradeep. I, I can I can tell the delegates or the attendees that they are not very far away. Afino is in the office, so it is in my office. And impulse oximetry, oscillometry is will be in is at least at the present moment in big hospitals to begin with, especially for people who are doing exclusive pulmonology. And within no time, as as the prices drop will come to to almost all cities of india and 
maybe it's uh, uh, one can go to a, a, one of the articles which have been published in Indian Pediatrics by Dr. Cabra's group on uh, on uh, various parameters which can be seen in, in pulse os oscillometry. And um, I'm sure within we'll, we'll say another five or seven, 10 years, this will be a tool which we'll, we all will be utilizing for evaluation of patients with asthma, especially in children who are less than five years of age, who are very difficult to be labeled to be suffering from asthma. Thank you, sir. Yes, Pradeep. Thank you so much, uh, all delegates, uh, for attending this e talk. And thank you, Rajiv, sir, uh, for the uh, such a meaningful insight into the topic. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you sir. It's a pleasure. A very good evening to everyone and a good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Right. Have a great evening, sir. Bye bye. Bye. Good night.